All right, so we are now joined by Duquesne head basketball coach Keith Dambra. Keith, uh, th thanks so much for joining us today. It's a, it's a crazy time right now in the college basketball world, but uh, we appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time. Thanks for having me. Really looking forward to it. And uh, as, uh, as usual, uh, Chris will be joining us in uh, just a couple of minutes. He is running. Uh, he's, he, he had to attend to something. So Chris will be with us shortly, but we'll start the interview uh, just from the top here. Uh, we were just speaking about it, Coach, uh, right before we started the start of recording um, about how Duquesne is back and, and they're starting to you know get back into the swing of things for now at least. Um, how are you approaching these first uh, few days and first weeks? Uh, I mean, I would imagine you're, you're doing it very, very tentatively, but what's on the schedule for the first few weeks here? Well, we're only going to be here five weeks, which is a little shorter than normal for us. Yep. But, you know, just trying to keep everybody safe first and foremost and, uh, you know, get them tested, make sure we're healthy. And then, you know, try to get them in a little bit better condition. You know, right. obviously guys haven't done much since March, which is strange for college basketball players so we haven't had them in the spring we haven't had them in the summer so we just have to slowly get them inundated back into you know the flow of college basketball so well uh, i mentioned to you also we we spoke last week with steve donahue the ivy league is not planning on playing uh games at least during the first semester he he said that you know there is an outside shot that once the first semester is over uh they could get a couple of non-conference games in you know still 29 or 2020 uh but it just would have to be after the first semester was over uh what could you tell us right now about the general feeling within the atlantic 10 is uh are they leaning towards going that route or uh, are they still in a in a wait and see holding pattern right now i think right now we're in a wait and see again i don't want to speak, speak for bernard emma glade our commissioner but I mean, I think obviously uh, one thing I can give credit to the Ivy League about is I think the longer it goes, there'll be a little bit more uh, information, more knowledge, uh, maybe closer to a vaccine, uh, maybe better medicine. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, the other part of it is we can be flexible. We, we can finish in May or June even, you know, so we can actually play the whole season if we want to. You just have to think a little bit outside the box. Yep. And, Chris, we, uh, we now have you on. How you doing? Hey, hey, coach. How's it going? Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. Sorry for the uh, delay. I had a quick work, a late work meeting, but I'm I'm all set to go. I'm looking forward to this. We just uh, we just got through the first question. Uh, coach was just telling us basically that uh, you know the Atlantic Ten is just holding holding off right now on any decisions. They're wait and see. Um, and coach, I just wanted to also get to you know just the the non conference schedule. Uh, you know, if if it were to go on, I mean, I know right now. Uh, it, it's it's up in the air and, and there's a shot that, you know, it could get wiped out. Uh, but the last few years, you know, since you got to Duquesne, uh, the, the non-conference schedule hasn't exactly been the most challenging for you guys. But I realized this year in the in the offseason, at least from the games that I've, you know, seen come public here, you know, you got Nat Maryland in there, Belmont, potentially Furman or ETSU. I'm not sure if you guys have, have uh, officially announced either of those yet. It seems like you're trying to ramp up the non-conference schedule now. Is that an indication that you uh, you have those at-large hopes in mind at the moment? Well, I think, you know, uh, whenever you build a program, uh, you have to build a program, and that, that involves winning. So we did what we had to do in order to, you know, put Duquesne back in a position where they're relevant. And then we won in our league. You know, we went 10-8 and eight in the league one year. We went 11-7 and seven the next year. So we've shown we can be competitive. We, you know, we have all our starters back. Uh, so I will say we have a difficult time scheduling, probably a little bit harder than most of the other teams in our league because, one, uh, a lot of people around the country don't think Duquesne's any good right. because for 45 years they've never been in the NCAA tournament. And then, secondly, I've coached for 30 years, so, you know, people don't want to play. So, like, <laughs> you know, this year Pitt dropped us again. So we, we couldn't play them. Uh, we, we caught a million people to get bought, and we can't get by games. So what we try to do is just get the best mid-major teams we can play. And, you know, uh, even Furman, Furman dropped us at the last minute. So, you know, the East Tennessee State, you know, when Coach Forbes left, they're not playing. So we added Belmont. We added Hofstra. Uh, you know, uh, we added Winthrop. So we try to get the best mid-majors we can play that are willing to play. And yeah. 
So uh, we've had a hard time scheduling, to be quite honest with you. Hofstra's got something on conference. I, I think every coach that we have on here says, tells us they're playing Hofstra. We're, we're getting the entire Hofstra schedule on. I think that's because Joe's 150 years old. And so he's <laughs> we got we to gotta tell him that he's, he's been on the show a couple of times. We'll have to tell him he said that. Um, I think we also uh, – I think it was Greg Gary from Mercer who we spoke to. Um, who said that they were uh, kind of following the same strategy and, and looking into Belmont, Murray State, just these mid-major teams that, you know, even though you can't maybe get all these Power Six matchups, you can get these good teams that you know are going to boost your resume, um, really win or lose. Uh, but ultimately, the good thing for you guys is that you're in a conference that has a chance to be extremely good this upcoming season. Um, and – I just wanted to ask you, um, because the, the A-10 is kind of like a, a – it's not quite a mid-major. It's not quite a high major. Um, and there are, it's often that there are multiple bids. Um, but obviously you want to keep pushing the conference higher. Have you given it a thought as to, you know, maybe what the impact of a canceled non-conference season could mean to your at-large chances, if it, if it could potentially hurt you? And, you know, do you think that maybe this is something that could – affect mid-majors as a whole negatively uh, uh, on that kind of national scale? Well, as we all know, the, uh, the NCAA tournament uh, selection certainly does not favor the mid-majors. Yes, So <laughs> any, kind of, any kind of non-conference games that are eliminated probably hurt us more than help us because, again, we're not going to get the clout within our league that we deserve unless we beat the high majors. And so, you know, there's some teams in our league that are extremely capable of beating the good teams around the country. And I think uh, that's probably uh, the biggest thing for our league is making sure that we play in the non-conference. Do you think that there's any – is there any sort of chance, uh, you know, if they do eliminate, let, let's just, you know, we're, we're doing hypotheticals here. It, it's, it's, there's not much else we can do, but, but, you know, kind of just think of hypothetical situations. Is there a shot? I mean, they, they're going to have to give some sort of uh, at large bid allotment to mid-major schools. I, I, I can't imagine because I would imagine the net is going to, if there's no non-conference, it's going to favor the power five, power six. They're going to have to give some sort of allotment to mid-major schools. Is there any chatter right now as to, you know, what that may be? Could they give, you know, a set six, seven bids and say, all right, the best six or seven mid-majors get in? Have you heard anything like that in, in, uh, in, on the national scale so far? So you guys, you guys do this a little bit more than I do because I kind of just control what I can control. But, <laughs> but I might be wrong on this, but to me there's only three or four – mid-major bids out there every year unless it's a strange year and that's if you count like Gonzaga and people like that as a mid-major really they aren't right so you know so like that's the that's the dilemma that you know that we're in and that puts tremendous pressure on a program and a coach to win the last game you know like so I was in the MAC so I know um traditional one bid league only kind of multiple bids, I think, six times. The Atlantic 10, you know, is better because, you know, we you know, we can get multiple bids, but the problem is there's 14 teams and there's a lot of good teams. Right. Right. So, like, that makes it hard, too. Like, last year I thought we were in position at four or five teams at one point, and then we started knocking each other out, oh, off yeah. just like the big boys do, and pretty soon we're down to two. You know, yep. so, again, it's, it's a catch-22. Like, balance is good, but balance is bad, too, for – leagues like ours yeah yeah definitely I remember going into the into the non or into the conference schedule it was looking pretty good for you guys and then you know VCU I think lost six games in a row or something like that and VCU was a very good team but that just goes to show you how good the league was and I think it's going to be even better this year although you don't have you know necessarily the national title contender like you did last year Uh, I wanted to talk about the the, the the team itself and just you know you mentioned it earlier bringing back uh, the entire starting five I think the only one that the only player that played significant minutes last year that doesn't come back is Bailey Steele um, you know what makes you excited about this group as a whole and what are your expectations going into the season so I think the biggest difference between when we were at Akron versus Duquesne has been our consistency of maturity and playing older guys and uh 
playing older guys isn't necessarily the answer to winning. Uh, we have to take another step, obviously. I thought that physically we were good enough last year to play with anybody in the league, but probably maturity and mentally uh, we weren't good enough to be a championship uh, quality team. And I felt like that was probably the biggest thing at Akron that we had over Duquesne is we had that culture built up where we thought even if we weren't that good, we thought we were good. And I think that's probably the biggest difference. So we have a good nucleus of guys back, but we also have a good nucleus of young people back or coming in. So we feel like our depth is better. We've improved some areas that we, we need to get better in. And uh, part of that is shooting the ball better. Uh, being a little longer defensively on the wings. And we've, we've kind of addressed those needs. And then, you know, trying to get another impact guy inside, which has always been a trademark of my teams. Yeah, and something else that has been a trademark of your teams has been um, a really good three-point defense and something that uh, has dated back to your days in Akron. Um, we've talked about this – statistic a lot on our show and with a lot of different coaches um, because I feel like it is something that people generally talk about as do we uh, being you know having a certain element of luck and a certain element of regression that that factors into it um, but also you know we've learned too and, and some of the coaches we've talked to as well have pointed this out that you know when you analyze certain certain tape and, and you know just how those numbers uh, really kind of relay what your team is doing there's obviously a skill factor to it so to you know for you guys again as a team that's been doing it so well for so long obviously it, it cannot be luck like you know there's obviously uh, it's obviously a skill for your team what are you doing as a coach to make sure that you know that area where there is some luck involved is more controlled by you and what you do well I think that again I'm not a huge analytics guy but I'm smart enough to know that it matters and so the one thing I know about the three-point line is, uh, is how many attempts you give up. And so, like, what we try to do is limit attempts at the three-point line because a lot of the attempts are open shots. So if you limit the attempts, then probably you're going to give up less threes. And that's more important than the percentage. So one of the reasons that, that we're pretty good at the three-point line is we're more of a passing lane team. And there's more people now playing gaps. And so I think because you're a passing lane team, you're forcing people out on the floor a little bit further. And then we've also been big inside where we haven't had to double as much in the post, which kind of allows you to stay out of rotations. So I think, you know, the less rotations you make, uh, the more aggressive you are out on the floor, uh, the better chance you have to not give up threes. And then the third part of that, obviously, is you can't give up dribble penetration, force yourself to help, and then that gives up threes as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the attempts and the percentage have both been extremely favorable sure. since, since you've been at Duquesne. Uh, so you guys are doing a good job of it. Whether you want to take this question, uh, you know, statistic, statistically, or if you want to, you know, just give us uh, your perception of, you know, a, a certain uh, behind-the-scenes thing, I just wanted to ask you, in terms of your last season and then going into this season, uh, give me one aspect of uh, Duquesne basketball last year that you were extremely satisfied with that you think, uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're okay taking it into this season and not making adjustments. And then one thing that you think needs uh, work and needs, uh, it needs some attention uh, going into the season. I think first and foremost, we made improvements passing the ball and I'd like to see continued improvement there. Our assist to turnover ratio finally turned to a decent number. Uh, so we were better there. Uh, our three-point shooting has to be better. Uh, we were a much better shooting team uh, at Akron than we've been at Duquesne. And then the, the second area is we have to defensive rebound the ball better. We've done a pathetic job in our three years here rebounding the ball for whatever reason. And so, like, those are areas that if you're really going to be a championship-quality team, you have to shoot the ball at a high rate from the three line because we shoot a lot of them and then you have to rebound the ball at the defensive end. Well, Coach, uh, I, I'm ho we're, we're both uh, praying that there is some sort of non-conference because we love the Atlantic 10, and uh, we want to see multiple bids from the A-10. Uh, we've talk we talked to uh, Chris Mooney a couple weeks ago, too, and uh, you know they're, they're going to be 
right up there with you guys. I think there's really a, there's a big five right now that, that I could see, you know, being in the at-large discussion. So to have Duquesne basketball uh, in, in the at-large discussion going into a season is pretty remarkable. So you're doing a great job there. And uh, we, we really thank you for giving us uh, this time today. And uh, we wish you the best of luck getting things together and straightened out. And hopefully we, we have a season to, to watch you this year. Yeah, you guys do a terrific job. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it, Coach. All right, you guys take care. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.